Some of you are saying, well, I got a record. I was locked up. Somebody is saying, well, I didn't finish college. But faith releases God's grace. Some of you are saying, I don't have enough money. I'm not as articulate as you are. I'm not sure how it's going to work, but I'm just going to step out on faith and trust God. Faith releases God's grace. I'm not sure, but faith releases God's grace. Grace. This faith life is actually scary and it's hard, but God is with you. And that eternal perspective is the realization that what I'm doing by faith, I may not see the fruit of it. I may be doing something for my children. God is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everything that he does is eternal and generational. That's the faith life. You can't be worried about what's going to happen on Tuesday or what happened on Wednesday. God is thinking about 100 years down the road. You don't know what God is going to do if you just step out on faith. Amen. Amen. Is anybody glad that God is more than able in here this morning? Amen. God is definitely more than able. I'm so happy to be with you all this morning, TWC family. Let me rush to, again, express my appreciation for Bishop and Dr. Ty, um, two of the most phenomenal world-class leaders, okay, that, that we have not only in this city, but, but in this state, um, Bishop has opened his life to me and opened up space for me to be here. And Bishop, I am truly grateful, and I'll be forever grateful for what you've done and what you've deposited in me. I'm a better man, a better pastor, a better father um, because of you. So thank you. Amen. All right, y'all ready for the word? Yeah. Let's do it. We're going to turn to Romans 4. And I'm going to read verses 13 um, through 25, Romans 4, 13 through 25. Uh, let me also acknowledge my wife before I get slapped. Um, she is in here somewhere. Hey, Em, love you. And also, my brother is here, Courtney, and my two nephews. Um, so we thank God for them. Romans chapter 4. Verse 13, it reads like this. It says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Verse 18, this is our theme verse this morning. It says, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Would you breathe a word of prayer with me? Father God, we come to you today, Lord, asking for your spirit, God. I've studied, but I need your spirit, Father. I've prayed, Father, I need your power. Lord God, I pray that you would give me mental and spiritual energy, God. Destroy any self-righteousness in me, Father, that would want to rear his head, God. Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of mind, concision of speech, and conviction of heart. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. 
Amen. I would like to talk from the thought this morning, faith for the impossible. I want to talk from the thought, faith for the impossible. So I'm a pastor's kid. Any other pastor's kids in here? I know y'all hiding in here somewhere. I'm a pastor's kid, and so as a pastor's son, you know you're always being taught something, right? So as a young man, my dad was always emphasizing this whole by faith thing. I, I never understood it until I got older, but he would always just be saying by faith. So I can remember one time we were, my dad loved to fish. One time we were out in the Gulf and we went fishing. We were finishing up and we were headed back into the shore. And all of a sudden this deep, deep fog just came over the, the ocean floor. And this fog was so deep that we literally could not see in front of us. We couldn't see anything. It just, it surrounded us. We could have run easily into another boat coming back in, or we could have ran aground because it's shallow when you're coming back in. And me and my brothers were in the boat freaking out. We're like, uh, Dad, like, you're not going to pull over? How are we going to get back? And my dad said in a calm, collective voice, he was like, by faith. I can remember another time. Um, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida. This was 2004, and we have hurricanes down there. And this, in 2004, there was a particularly bad hurricane, Hurricane Ivan. And, you know, we weathered the storm in my house, but we, we left my house and go, went to go check on the church. And when we got to the street where the church was at, there was no building left. There was, there was nothing. The only thing that we found was a sign that used to be on the front of our church. And so I looked to my dad, I'm in the truck with him. I said, dad, how are we gonna have church? And he said, son, by faith. I can remember a third time when I was married to my wife, we were expecting our first daughter and I had all of the normal anxieties that a first time parent would have. I said, Dad, hey, you know, we're already, you know, paying student loans. We're already trying to make stuff meet. You know, how am I going to pay for a child also? He said, son, let me tell you. He said, this is what you do. When you eat, you let them eat. He said, when, when you go to sleep, wherever you sleep, you let them lay down and go to sleep. He said, when you go buy yourself some clothes, he said, you go ahead and, and you buy them some clothes. To this day, I still don't know what that means, right? <laughs> I'm like, Dad, isn't that, isn't that the whole point? Like, I, I cannot do those. I don't feel adequate to do those things. But what I think he was trying to tell me was, you have to do it by faith. In the same way that you get up and you get dressed, and you go and you get something to eat, and you lay down, you have to do all of this by faith. And I believe this is what Paul is trying to tell us in this passage today. He's trying to tell us, he's been talking in Romans about how the Jews who were um, God's chosen people were thinking that they were righteous because they adhered to the law, right? And they had the sign and the seal of circumcision. And so because of that, they believe that they were in and of themselves righteous. But Paul in chapters one through three is making the case that there is no way you can be righteous in and of yourself. He's making the case that actually righteousness that God requires of us is actually the righteousness that Christ is and that we can only acquire by faith. He's been making that case this whole time up to chapter four and in chapter four. But today we wanna to talk about faith for the impossible. The reality is God often calls us to things that seem humanly impossible. You know, it would be one thing if God just called us to normal things like, hey, Dan, I want you to go home today and use your computer. Okay, God, you know, I, I can work with that. Or, hey, Dan, I just want you, to, I want you to go to work. You know, I can deal with the things that I can see and that I can handle. But God often calls us to promises, right, that are beyond what are really humanly possible. He calls us to things that are beyond what we really feel adequate to do in and of ourselves, right? He calls us beyond things that, are, that we can imagine or that we can see. And so what we want to talk about today is how do we develop? How do we walk in 
faith for the impossible. The first thing we learn is that faith for the impossible starts with us turning. Faith for the impossible starts with us turning. So in Genesis chapter 15, God comes to Abraham and he gives Abraham this promise. He says, Abraham, I am going to take you and I am going to give you offspring. Kings are going to come from you, many nations. I'm going to give you all these children. Now, Abraham has zero children and he's super duper old, right? He, he's like dust, right? He's, he's practically dust. And God comes to him and he tells him that this is the promise. Genesis 15 says that Abraham then believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Then we fast forward to Genesis 17. Abra- God comes back to Abraham again and he reaffirms that promise, the covenant. He says, except this time I want you to get circumcised. I want you to circumcise yourself and all the males in your house, right? This would be a sign and seal of this covenant that we have made. But Paul makes the point in Romans 4 that Abraham believed God in 15, and it was accounted to him as righteousness before he was ever circumcised in Genesis chapter 17, right? And so the point that Paul makes now is the Jews believed that circumcision was the line of demarcation. If you had been circumcised and you were on this side, you're good, right? It was circumcision. But if you were not circumcised, you were on this side and therefore bad. But Paul is making the case that no, it had always been about faith. It never had anything to do with what you were doing. It was only by faith that people are made righteous. So the thing about circumcision is it's not like it was a bad thing. Circumcision was a sign and it was a seal of the covenant. Circumcision was prescribed by God for all of the men who were Jews. It wasn't a bad thing. But the point that Paul wants to make in this passage is that it's not our bad deeds that we need saving from. We know that those are not worth anything to God. But it's actually the idea that our good deeds merit us something from God. Paul is saying what we need to do is turn from that man over here to the man of faith. We have to continually turn from the idea that my good works not only merit me something from God, but enable me to do anything for God. It is only through faith that a person can move, breathe, and function in God. That is the point that Paul is trying to make here first. And so we have to understand that faith is a constant life of turning from this man. Turning from the man who says, you know, I'm just gonna pick it up by my own bootstraps. I'm good enough, right? Turning from that man and turning to the man of faith that says, I believe God. And through believing God, that's how everything is going to happen, right? Verse 14, Paul, is, it says, if it were possible to save ourselves with our own effort, we would not need faith. If you can do it yourself, please go ahead. Pass, go, collect $200. You do not need faith. You, do, you also do not need a promise, and you really don't need God. If you can do it on yourself, keep going. But verse 15, he says, but that's not possible, right? It's not possible because it's not possible to keep the law fully. Okay, he makes that point there. It's not possible. Now, this is actually good news for us. Because if you're anything like me, I have good days, And I have some bad days, right? I have some days where, you know, I'm knocking it out the park, right? Man, me and the Lord, we're just, we're walking together like Moses. But then I have those days where, you know, I've done something to my kids that they may need counseling for later. You know, I've treated my wife in a way that, you know, does not show God honor. Am I by myself this morning? Are y'all going to talk to me? I, I could be just the only one, but there's days where I'm just completely missing it, right? And some of us, we walk around with this heavy weight 
of shame and condemnation because we have missed it. But the reality is, on those days especially, we need to look to Christ in faith, right, who is our righteousness. Because it's not my righteousness, but it's Christ's righteousness that makes me righteous. Why are you telling me this, Dan? I'm telling you this because developing that muscle, that muscle of turning from looking at myself to then looking at God and what God can do, that is the muscle that we have to develop when it comes to faith for the impossible. Let's turn right quick to Galatians 3, 2 through 7. Galatians 3, 2 through 7. Paul says here, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul's point here is like, is listen, going along this Christian life, you'll be tempted to go back to this man right here, right? That's always going to be the natural default is to turn back to this man right here who wants to lean on himself, depend on himself. But he's saying, hey, no, you came in this thing by faith. You're going to continue it by faith, and you have to constantly turn yourself back to faith. That is the muscle that we have to develop. Have y'all ever watched Steph Curry? Steph Curry is playing basketball and shooting threes from, like, half court, right? I mean, he's running around the screen, and he's coming up. He's catching it, and he's shooting it over, like, six, eight guys. Steph is not thinking about anything when he's shooting those shots. It's happening way, 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 way too fast, right? It's all moving so quick. It's all depending on his muscle memory. This is, this is something that he's developed over years and years and years. He's developed this muscle memory over time to where when he now needs to do this in a game time situation, he's not even thinking about it. He's just simply acting and doing in what he already knew to do. You see, that's what faith is like for us. As we remember, hey, it was God that actually brought me out of that depression. You know, I really couldn't get myself up. I was, I was sick, right? It was God that brought me out. Of, I didn't have the money, but it was God that brought me out. Of, as we remember and think about the faith that it took, we developed that muscle. And we're able to then continue and walk in faith as we began. But not only that, but faith for the impossible it can be grown. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 18 with me. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. It says, In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. Now, this sentence is kind of difficult to understand in, in the way they wrote it, but what it essentially is saying is, Abraham not or the rational, right? Abraham acknowledged that, hey, I am super duper old. I'm 100 years old. My wife, it says the way of women had left her. <laughs> Meaning like there ain't, you know, I'm not a gynecologist, but there was, there was nothing going on down there, right? There was nothing to, to be had. He didn't ignore the rational. But he just didn't think that God was bound by the rational. He, he didn't refuse to look at it, but he just, he said to himself, you know what? I don't think God is bound by everything that I can see. Right? Now, some of us, we, we, we believe God. We believe in him. But the question that we're, we've been wondering is, God, I see I see what you're saying, and I see what the reality of my situation is. I just don't understand how. I, 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 just, I just don't get how. It's, it's not that I don't believe you. It's not that I don't believe you're there. 
I, I literally, I just, I don't see how you could do this. Abraham had the same struggle. Do y'all remember Hagar? That was Abraham trying to figure out how. Abraham was like, okay, I'm super old. She's super old, but she's not. She's not old. Okay, maybe this is how. Some of us are, are in that place of how. Some of us are just in the place of, of waiting. You see how it can be done, but you've just had to wait. God, I've been to like seven different marriages of my friends. And I, I just haven't, it just hasn't happened for me yet, God. I'm, I'm, I'm having to wait. Lord, you, you told me that, you told me that you were a healer. I'm just, I'm, I'm having to wait now. You just have me, you have me here waiting. God, I'm believing for my children. I, I believe you can do it. I just, I, I've had to wait. And what happens is waiting ends up, it could, it could do a couple things to us. Time can do a couple things to us, right? See, I let some time go by. Some of y'all got anxious just now. <laughs> y'all was like, bro, done forgot his lines or something. He done forgot. Something done happened. Something done messed up. He done... No, it's just it, 10 seconds went by. <laughs> Nothing happened. It's just, it's, it's waiting. We don't like the wait. We, we get anxious. We're like, man, something is wrong. Something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with the world. Something is not happening right. But maybe you've just been called to wait right now. Maybe you're just in a season where you, where you need to wait. Could, could that be possible for us? Sometimes it becomes embarrassing when we have to wait. We like, man, dog, like, man, you, you got me waiting this long? Waiting can, waiting can be difficult, right? Waiting can, can be frustrating. But we have had some examples go before us. How about the people that were um, in this city in the 60s and 70s? Do y'all remember them? They, they had to wait. They were waiting at, in diners, right? They were, they, were, they were waiting on buses. They were waiting in, in lines to vote. They had to wait as they marched. They believed that God would bring equality as he had promised as black people as in the image of God. But they had to wait. They had to wait to see that happen. But this is how they waited, actively. They, they, didn't, they didn't resign in their, in, their, in their waiting. See, it says in the passage here that Abraham did not weaken in his faith. Now, the original language bequeaths to us this idea that Abraham did not become inactive in his waiting. There, there is still activity to be had in the waiting because the promise is there. And so with the promise there, we then act in confidence that God is going to bring to fruition the thing that he promised while we wait. So I'm waiting, but I'm still, I'm still moving, right? I'm waiting, but I'm still believing. I'm still doing. I'm still serving. I'm still loving. I may be in a season of waiting, but that doesn't mean my life has stopped, right? But also, he didn't waver as he waited. So he didn't weaken, and he also didn't waver. This word waver, uh, it, it connotes the idea of, of judgment in the original. So it's talking about he didn't begin to critically judge God because he had to wait. He, he did not become bitter, right? He did not become bitter, angry, upset with God because now he's having to wait. That would have then destroyed his faith. If he's becoming bitter and not trusting in the God who had made the promise, then why would he continue to act? So he didn't, he didn't weaken. He didn't waver. But the passage says that he was caused to be able to feel capable 
as he gave praise to God. Let me read this in, in, the, in the language that I have here, because I just read my, my rendition. It says that he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. So as Abraham considered who God was, as he considered that this was the same God that had called me from my father's land, he called me from comfort. This is the same God that saved me, that actually gave my wife back when she was taken by the Egyptians. This is the same God that has done all of these different things. He didn't stop and give himself the credit. But the passage says, as he gave glory to God, his faith grew. I don't know if you're like me. I can get to different places in life where I then, I then stop and begin to think, you know, I think I, I did that. I think, I think, you know, I've gotten myself to this place. You know, I, I brought myself. Let me help. It's not because you're good looking. It, it ain't because of the family that you're from. It's not because you have just this great education. But it is because God has been with you that you have been able to make it this far. And the, the quicker we are able to give God the, the glory and give God the credit for the things that he's done, our faith will then grow. See, some of our faith are stuck because we didn't give all ourselves the credit. Oh, I, I, did, I did it. You know what I mean? I, I brought me. I brought me here. And it's like, no, as I give God the glory, as I give God the praise, I then, my faith is rising because I'm thinking about what he's done in his track record. It's not, I haven't brought myself. This is, God has brought me this far. But faith also understands what God is capable of. Faith, un, faith for the impossible understands what God is capable of. Verse 17, it says, as it is written, I have made you the father of of many nations, watch this, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives one life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In essence, Paul is essentially saying the same God that was there in Genesis, that same God, right, is the same God that is here in 2024 today. It's, it's not a different God. And so when God is, is promising something beyond the possible, it's because this same God who, number one, he was able to create. So, so if it, it doesn't exist, God can actually create out of nothing. We see in Genesis 1, in the very beginning of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God did what? God created. I'm so glad that God can create. He's speaking, right? Speaking into nothing. And something is coming from that nothing. Y'all gonna catch it in a second. Okay. God is, is literally speaking into nothingness. He's speaking into nothing. And then out of that nothing, something, something is coming. Because God's word does not describe reality. He's not looking out and saying, oh, look at the sun. Look at no, God's word is determining reality. So, so when he's speaking something, he's determining what it is that's going to be. Do y'all remember when David said, God, I need you to create in me a clean heart. David has slept with Bathsheba and killed someone. The prophet Nathan came to David and convicted David of his sin. And in, in his conviction, David then writes Psalm 51. David doesn't say, God, remodel in me a clean heart. That's, that's not what David says. David says, I need you to create in me. God, there's nothing good there. There's nothing left for you to salvage. It's not like you can come in and pick. No, God, there's nothing here. I need you to create in me. I need you to start all over again. I need you to just, just have a new beginning. I need you to take all the different things you can and just speak something new 
into my situation and into my life. God, create in me a new heart. Some of us need a whole new beginning. We've, we've made a wreck of our relationships. Some of us have made a wreck of our fine. God, I've made a wreck of my life. I need you to create something out of nothing. God has that ability. He can create. So he can, when he's promising things beyond the possible, number one, it's because if he needs to, he can create it. But number two, if he needs to, he can resurrect it. God can, he can resurrect it. The second half of that passage says, he, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead. Do you remember Abraham and Sarah? How do you think they had a baby? There was nothing in there, fam. That it, it was not, God had to literally resurrect that wound. He had to, he had to bring back the barrenness, right? We're, I'm just talking about biologically. He had to bring back something that was actually dead. We see Jesus in the New Testament, and all he's doing is bringing back people from the dead. All he's doing is touching people and bringing them back. What about the widow's son in Luke 7? God goes in, God stops a funeral. A funeral procession is on the way out. And he walks over and it says, with compassion in his heart, he reaches over and he tells the young man, hey, this is it's not your time today. I need you, you get on up. You, you get up, come on, rise back up. What about Jairus' daughter? He had to go in and bring and touch her hand and bring her back to life. What about Lazarus? Lazarus was wrapped up in the grave. He had been good dead. He was good and dead. He had folded up his tent a long time ago, four days ago. But it says that God called and he came forth. Jesus is doing these things to show us even if he has to raise something from the dead. If he has to raise something from the dead, he literally, he can do that. He's that type of God. It's the same God that was in Genesis. That's the same God that, that is here today. Many of us right now, we're, we're in situations that are dead. If, if truth be told, we're like, man, listen, I literally, I hate to admit it, but I, I quit on my marriage three years ago. It's dead. It's, it's nothing that can be done, it's, it's gone, it's dead. I've quit on that person, I quit on that relationship a long time ago. I quit on my dream, some of our dreams have died. God has put these things in us, he's put purpose in us. Yes, he's put purpose, and some of that we've let die. And it's like, man, God can resurrect that stuff. If you put it in his hands, right? See, it's one thing if you put something in my hands. Put it, put, you got a difficult problem, put it in my hands. It's about 35% chance that something's going to happen if you put it in my, in my hands, right? 40% on a good day. If you have something difficult that needs to be done and you put it, let's say you put it in the mayor's hands, right? There's, there's a little bit better chance. Maybe even the governor. But when we talk about you putting it in God's hands... People like, no, not the governor, okay. <laughs> but we're talking about when you put it in God's hands. These are the hands that formed the world, right? These are the hands that reached down and shaped you out of the dirt. These are the hands that have been holding you on the nights when you've been crying. Those same hands, when you put it in the hands of God, those are some capable hands. You see, it matters whose hands it's in. If you put it in God's hands, what could happen? See, the reason that God can promise beyond the possible is because he came down in a man in Jesus, and Jesus literally was the impossible personified. Think about that. Jesus was impossible personified. Jesus was born of a virgin, okay? 
That means a virgin had a baby and still remained a virgin. How, how, does, how does that happen? It's impossible without God. It was not possible for a man to stay with a virgin and believe she was a virgin and she got a baby. Fam, that's, it's not possible. It's, it's not possible. Without God, it's not possible. He escaped from King Herod's decree to kill all the babies under two years old. That would have not been possible without God. When Jesus was here on the earth, Jesus walked around and he escaped many times the Jews trying to kill him. How would he have done that if he wasn't God? It would have been impossible. And then it would have been impossible for Jesus after he had been murdered publicly. He was literally murdered publicly to get up and then walk around 40 days after with the holes still in him, with the holes still in his hands and the holes in his feet. Because God can do impossible things. He literally only does impossible things. The fact that you and I are sitting here today and we want to learn about the Bible, okay, that is impossible without God. God only does impossible stuff. He brings something out of nothing. God accepts no one except the abandoned, right? He makes no one healthy except the sick. He brings no one to life except the dead. He makes no one holy except sinners because God only does impossible things. Now, some of you today are in situations that I know this, this truth, this, is, this can be a heavy truth. You're like, do you really, do you know what's going on in my life? Right? Do, do you understand what you're speaking into right now? I have real problems. You know, this, this is not a game. I, have, I, I really have an impossible situation. I want to leave this bit of hope with you today. I'm not sure how God is going to work. I'm not sure what way he will handle it. But this is one thing I can tell you. Whatever happens, it's not because God doesn't love you. God, God proved that he loved you when he came in the impossible way of Jesus. I can remember in 2020 when my dad had prostate cancer. My dad, I love my dad. My dad was a great dad. Um, he, he fought and he wrestled with prostate cancer. And in 2020, he passed away. I was angry, okay? I was frustrated. I was hurt. I felt cheated. And I said, God, how can you take this man away from me? Right at this time, how can, how can you do that? And God one moment met me and he let me know that, Dan, when your dad passed away, he said, I wasn't sitting back folding my arms like this. He said, when you cried, I was crying. He said, when you were hurting, I was hurt. And he told me, I, I never found out the reason. I, I was like, God, but why? Why did you take him out of, out of all people, right? I never got the answer to that, fam. But God assured me, it's not because I don't love you. It, it's not. We can have faith in a God who was willing to give up everything for you and I to get to him. We can have faith for literally anything because God has a way of making the impossible possible. Jesus said it like this. He said, with men, yeah, it's not possible. But with God, but, but with God, all things, all things are possible. Heavenly Father, divine provider and sustainer of prosperity. With hearts filled with hope and aspiration, we come before you to offer our prayers for economic prosperity within our community. 
We recognize the importance of economic stability and the well-being it brings to individuals and families. We humbly seek your blessings for opportunities, financial security, and wise management of resources. Lord, we pray for economic stability within our community. May there be opportunities for gainful employment, sustainable livelihoods, and financial security for all. Bless those who are seeking employment with suitable jobs and rewarding careers. We ask for your guidance in the wise management of resources, both personal and communal. May we be good stewards of the blessings we receive, making sound financial decisions that promote prosperity and the well-being of our community. Lord, we recognize that economic prosperity is not just financial wealth, but also about the quality of life, access to basic needs, and the ability to plan for the future. May all members of our community experience a sense of financial well-being and security. We lift up those who may be facing financial challenges or hardships. May they find the support and resources they need to overcome difficulties and move toward economic stability. As we pray for economic prosperity, may we also be inspired to work together as a community to create opportunities for growth, development, and shared prosperity. Let us support initiatives that promote economic empowerment and financial education. Lord, help us to remember the importance of generosity and sharing in times of abundance. May we be compassionate toward those who may be less fortunate and extend a helping hand to those in need. In your divine name, we offer this prayer for economic prosperity within our community. May your blessings guide us towards financial stability and the well-being of all its members. Amen. Heavenly Father, divine source of unity and harmony. With hearts joined in prayer, we come before you to seek your blessings upon our community. We recognize the importance of unity and harmony in fostering a nurturing and thriving environment for all its members. Lord, we pray for a strong sense of unity among us, a unity that transcends our differences and binds us together as one community. Help us to understand that diversity is a source of strength. And may we embrace the richness of our varied backgrounds, beliefs, and experiences. We ask for the gift of harmony, dear Lord, that our interactions may be marked by peace, respect, and cooperation. May we approach one another with open hearts and a spirit of inclusivity, recognizing the inherent worth and dignity of each individual. Guide us in our efforts to build healthy relationships within our community. Grant us the wisdom to listen attentively, the empathy to understand one another's perspectives, and the patience to resolve conflicts with grace and compassion. Lord, help us to nurture an environment where all voices are heard, where no one feels marginalized or excluded, and where the needs and aspirations of every member are considered. May our community be a safe and welcoming space for all who seek refuge and belonging. As we pray for unity and harmony, may we also extend our love and support to those who may be struggling or feeling isolated. Let our acts of kindness and friendship be a testament to the strength of our community bonds. In your divine name, we offer this prayer for unity and harmony in our community. May your blessings guide us in our quest to create a place of understanding, cooperation, and inclusivity. In Jesus' name, amen.
Heavenly Father, divine creator of culture and artistry, with hearts filled with appreciation for the richness of our communities, cultural traditions and artistic endeavors, we come before you to offer our prayers. We recognize the importance of preserving and enriching our cultural heritage, and we seek your blessings for the vitality and vibrancy of our community life. Lord, we pray for the preservation of our cultural traditions. May the customs, rituals, and practices that have been passed down through generations continue to thrive and be celebrated within our community. Help us to honor the wisdom and beauty of our cultural heritage. We lift up our artists, musicians, writers, and creators who contribute to the cultural and artistic tapestry of our community. May they be inspired to create works that reflect the diversity, creativity, and spirit of our community. Lord, we ask for the enrichment of our social activities. May our gatherings, festivals, and events be joyful occasions that foster a sense of unity and belonging. Bless our efforts to create inclusive and welcoming spaces for all residents. We recognize that culture and art have the power to bridge divides and build connections among people. May our community be a place where individuals from all backgrounds come together to share in the beauty of our diverse traditions and expressions. As we pray for cultural and social enrichment, may we also be inspired to actively participate in and support the cultural and artistic endeavors of our community. Let us celebrate and promote the talents and contributions of our artists and cultural leaders. Lord, help us to understand that culture and art are not static, but evolving expressions of our shared identity. May our community continue to grow and adapt, drawing strength from its cultural roots while embracing new creative expressions. In your divine name, we offer this prayer for the preservation and enrichment of cultural and social life within our community. May your blessings inspire us to celebrate our diversity and nurture our artistic spirit. Amen. source of wisdom and guidance. With hearts filled with hope and responsibility, we come before you to offer our prayers for the leaders and authorities in our community. We understand the vital role they play in shaping the future and well-being of our residents. We humbly seek your blessings upon them, asking for wisdom, integrity, and a deep commitment to the welfare of all. Lord, we pray for our community's leaders, whether in government, local administration, or community organizations. May they be guided by wisdom and insight in their decision-making, seeking the greater good and the well-being of all residents. Grant our leaders the strength and courage to uphold principles of justice, fairness, and equity. May they recognize the importance of inclusivity, valuing the diversity of voices and perspectives within our community. We ask for integrity and leadership, dear Lord. May our leaders be honest and accountable in their actions, setting an example of ethical conduct for all to follow. Help them resist the temptation of corruption and self-interest. Lord, we pray for authorities and institutions that serve our community, such as law enforcement, educational boards, and health care providers. May they operate with transparency, compassion, and a genuine commitment to the welfare of the people they serve. And as we lift up prayers for leadership and governance, may we also be inspired to actively engage in the civic life of our community. Let us exercise our rights and responsibilities as citizens, participating in constructive dialogue and working together to build a better future. Lord, help us remember that leadership is a sacred trust, and those in positions of authority have a responsibility to serve the greater good. May our community leaders be blessed with discernment and empathy as they navigate the complexities of governance. In your divine name, we offer this prayer for leadership and governance within our community. 
May your wisdom guide our leaders in their decisions, and may they be agents of positive change and progress. Amen. Father God, Heavenly Provider, with hearts filled with gratitude, we come before you as a family, recognizing you as the source of all abundance. In a world filled with uncertainties, we seek your divine guidance and blessings for financial stability and provision. We acknowledge that you are the ultimate caretaker of our needs. We ask for your wisdom to manage our resources wisely that we may be good stewards of the blessings you have entrusted to us. Help us to make sound financial decisions, to live within our means, and to save for the future. Grant us the ability to prosper in ways that align with your purpose for our lives. Open doors of opportunity that lead to fruitful endeavors and bless the work of our hands as we labor diligently to provide for our family. In times of financial strain, grant us the strength to remain steadfast in our faith. May we trust in your divine plan, knowing that you see our needs and will provide according to your perfect timing. Teach us to be content with what we have, while also striving for a better future. Give us the courage to seek out avenues for growth and improvement always mindful of the values that guide us. May our financial well-being never overshadow our love for one another. Help us to prioritize the richness of our relationships and to support one another in times of need. As we journey through life, may our family be a testament to your faithfulness in providing for those who trust in you. We offer this prayer your hearts open to receiving your blessings, knowing that you are our unwavering source of provision and security. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, divine provider and sustainer of prosperity, with hearts filled with hope and aspiration, we come before you to offer our prayers for economic prosperity within our community. We recognize the importance of economic stability and the well-being it brings to individuals and families. We humbly seek your blessings for opportunities, financial security, and wise management of resources. Lord, we pray for economic stability within our community. May there be opportunities for gainful employment, sustainable livelihoods, and financial security for all. Bless those who are seeking employment with suitable jobs and rewarding careers. We ask for your guidance in the wise management of resources, both personal and communal. May we be good stewards of the blessings we receive making sound financial decisions that promote prosperity and the well-being of our community. Lord, we recognize that economic prosperity is not just financial wealth, but also about the quality of life, access to basic needs, and the ability to plan for the future. May all members of our community experience a sense of financial well-being and security. We lift up those who may be facing financial challenges or hardships. May they find the support and resources they need to overcome difficulties and move toward economic stability. As we pray for economic prosperity, may we also be inspired to work together as a community to create opportunities for growth, development, and shared prosperity. Let us support initiatives that promote economic empowerment and financial education. Lord, help us to remember the importance of generosity and sharing in times of abundance. 
May we be compassionate toward those who may be less fortunate and extend a helping hand to those in need. In your divine name, we offer this prayer for economic prosperity within our community. May your blessings guide us towards financial stability and the well-being of all its members. Amen. Dear Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We come before you today, Lord, first giving praise, honor, and glory, not asking or seeking anything, but just giving thanks. Thank you, God, for everything you've done in our past, present, and future. Thank you for the blessings that take us to the ultimate heights of life. And we thank you for about the valleys that draw us closer to you and strengthen us for all that we will endure. Thank you, God, for your constant presence in our lives. Thank you for never leaving us, always being our protector, our hedge of protection when we are aware and unaware. Thank you, Lord, for every financial blessing that you've bestowed upon us already and every blessing on its way. Thank you for the financial fortitude to honor that you've given us. Thank you that the windows of heaven shall pour out blessings that will completely blow our minds. Thank you for the financial favor for every project that you place under our stewardship. In every opportunity that you've given or will give it is our promise to honor you in it. We thank you in advance for the financial blessings that will not just address every need, but will also result in overflow. In all things, we give you praise, honor, and glory. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Heavenly Father, I come before you today recognizing that financial stability is an important aspect of our marriage. Lord, I seek your guidance and provision in managing our finances as a couple. You are the ultimate provider, and I trust in your wisdom and grace to help us make sound financial decisions. Lord, please grant us the wisdom to be good stewards of the resources you have entrusted to us. Help us to budget wisely, save for the future, and make informed financial choices that align with your will. May our financial decisions be marked by unity and transparency. Help us to communicate openly about our financial goals, challenges, and priorities. Let our discussions about money be free from conflict and filled with mutual respect and understanding. I pray for your provision, Lord. Bless our work and endeavor so that we may have the means to meet our needs and the needs of our family. Give us the discipline to avoid unnecessary debt and the wisdom to seek help when financial struggles arise. Lord, remind us that our security ultimately comes from you, not from our bank accounts. Help us to trust in your provision and to be content with what we have, knowing that you are always with us. I also pray for generosity and a heart to give to those in need. Help us to be mindful of the less fortunate and to use our financial resources to make a positive impact on the lives of others. Thank you, Lord, for your guidance and provision in our financial journey as a couple. I trust that with your help, we can achieve financial stability and use our resources in ways that honor you and benefit our family and others. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. <laughs>